Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera, shalom, om swastiastu, nama budaya, dan salam sehat untuk kita semua Selamat bergabung dalam webinar Implementation of a Safe and Sustainable Radio Pharmaceutical Supply and Distribution Service for Indonesia Sebelum webinar dimulai sesaat lagi untuk menemani waktu Anda menunggu Anda dapat menikmati terlebih dahulu sajian lagu-lagu berikut ini. Selamat menikmati. in a beautiful land which everything in it lived peacefully. She spent all her time in the depth of a forest with her eight little friends. There was a hidden secret place so magical and dangerous at the same time. This is the story where the culture had start. And now, let me take you on a journey. So welcome to Wonderland Indonesia, the sacred Nusantara.
Ya, baik para peserta webinar yang kami hormati, demikian tadi telah kita nikmati bersama sajian lagu untuk sedikit menyegarkan suasana di pagi hari ini. Dan kini saatnya kita memasuki inti acara Webinar Implementation of a Safe and Sustainable Radio Pharmaceutical Supply and Distribution Service for Indonesia. Selamat mengikuti. Oke, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greetings to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar titled Implementation of a Safe and Sustainable Radio Pharmaceutical Supply and Distribution Service for Indonesia on Tuesday, 3rd of October 2023 on 10 until 12 a.m. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce myself. I am Alif Indira as the master of the ceremony of today's event. Thank you and also welcome to all of you of the participant of today's event uh, in the Zoom webinar and also from the live streaming YouTube PKMKFKUGM. And also I'd like to welcome to our uh, guest speakers, Dr. Budi Suryadarma, Pak Hans Wijaya, Greg Santa Maria, sorry, Mark Frazetto, John Evans, and our beloved Prof. Laksono Trisnantoro. So before our, uh, we begin our today's event, I'd like to read our schedule first for uh, our today's event. So first of all, there will be an opening session that will be delivered uh, from Dr. Budi Surya Dharma and also Pak Hans Wijaya, and then continued with introduction from our Professor Laksono Trisnantoro, and then uh, continued by the Psychotech story, 20 years in development from Greg Santa Maria and Mark Frazetto, and, uh, and then continued with the Psychotech Indonesia from uh, Greg Santa Maria and John Evans, and also the general discussion Uh, with our moderator, Prof. Laksono, and then uh, closed by the closing remarks. So for the first agenda, there will be an opening session that will be delivered by our guest speaker, Dr. Budi Surya Dharma, as the Director of Medical Referral Care from the Ministry of Health, Republic Indonesia. Uh, he will uh, he will deliver about the Indonesia policy on cyclotron. For uh, Dr. Budi Surya Dharma, the time is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, uh, izin saya mempergunakan bahasa Indonesia. Uh, Saya mewakili Ibu Direktur Pelayanan Kesehatan Rujukan, di mana beliau uh, pada saat yang bersamaan ada ada rapat yang tidak bisa uh, ditinggalkan. Ini saya menyampaikan materi yang uh, sedianya Bu Direktur Pelayanan Kesehatan Rujukan, Dr. Gigi uh, Sari, uh, terkait role siklotron Onkologi Roadmap for Indonesia. Ya, yeah, next slide. Ya, yeah. jadi uh, slide ini terbagi menjadi tiga, yaitu transformasi layanan rujukan kanker 
Yang kedua adalah jejaring pengampuan stratifikasi pelayanan kanker dan pemenuhan pelayanan kedokteran nuklir. Jadi pembahasan materi ini ada uh, tiga unsur yang akan kita sampaikan dari uh, Direktorat Yankes Rujukan Kemenkes. Ya, lanjut. Bahwa uh, Bapak-Ibu uh, kita sudah sering mendengar dan kemudian juga sering melihat bahwa kita Kementerian Kesehatan berkomitmen untuk melakukan transformasi sistem kesehatan di mana sebagai upaya untuk memperbaiki sistem kesehatan di Indonesia di mana uh, ini adalah sejalan dengan visi Presiden mewujudkan masyarakat sehat, produktif, mandiri, dan berkeadilan dan tentunya ada enam pilar yang dicanangkan oleh Kementerian Kesehatan yaitu transformasi layanan primer sebagai pilar pertama, yang kedua adalah transformasi layanan rujukan, yang ketiga adalah transformasi sistem ketahanan kesehatan, keempat transformasi sistem pembiayaan kesehatan, kemudian yang kelima transformasi SDM kesehatan, dan yang keenam transformasi terkait teknologi kesehatan. Pada kali ini yang kita bahas tadi sesuai dengan poin yang 1, 2, 3 yang saya sampaikan di depan, maka eh, kami da, transformasi layanan rujukan yang memang sedang kita eh, galakkan dan sudah kita laksanakan di beberapa wilayah provinsi di Indonesia dengan bertujuan untuk meningkatkan akses dan mutu layanan rumah sakit-rumah sakit baik yang sekunder maupun tersier. Kita fokuskan juga untuk pembangunan-pembangunan uh, rumah sakit di kawasan Indonesia Timur, kemudian juga membangun jaringan pengampuan layanan unggulan, juga kita menjalin kemitraan dengan institusi-institusi kesehatan uh, di dalam maupun di luar negeri. Ya, lanjut. Terkait kasus-kasus uh, kanker, uh, memang diproyeksikan memang makin hari, makin tahun, makin meningkat. gitu ya Proyeksi kasus baru ini, uh, kematian akibat kanker di Indonesia dari 2018 sampai 2040, uh, Bapak-Ibu bisa lihat tabulasi di sini terkait insidensi kematian, insidensi dan kematian itu Makin hari makin meningkat, di mana angka kematian kanker dari angka insiden mencapai 64 persen perkiraan di tahun 2040. Nah, tentunya ini uh, perlu kita uh, cermati bersama bahwa bahwasanya pasien kanker uh, 70 persen itu datang ke rumah sakit sudah mengalami fase stadium lanjut dan uh, dari hasil identifikasi inventarisir kami bahwa ternyata untuk keganasan yang terbanyak pada uh, pasien laki-laki adalah CA atrakea bronkus maupun CA paru. Nah untuk yang wanita itu terbanyak pada uh, CA payudara atau breast cancer dan Uh, cervix uh, uteri. Ya, lanjut. Nah, ini skema program prioritas transformasi layanan rujukan, di mana tadi sudah saya sampaikan di depan adalah bagaimana mengupayakan peningkatan uh, akses dan mutu. Dan ini tentunya juga terkait uh, sarpras, pengadaan sarpras, alkes, dan obat-obatan. Di samping kepemimpinan atau leadership dan uh, patient center care. Nah, Bapak Ibu, uh, kita bisa lihat untuk yang akses uh, untuk mutu itu mulai dari peningkatan mutu, center of excellence, one stop service, sister hospital dan digitalisasi layanan rujukan. Itu fokus kita untuk peningkatan mutu. Kalau peningkatan akses kita sudah bangun di daerah-daerah itu mulai dari Uh, apa, penajamannya di 2020 uh, terkait stratifikasi dan jejaring pengampuan layanan prioritas. Kita sudah identifikasi rumah uh, sakit-rumah sakit berdasarkan stratifikasi 
dan kemudian kita meng, e, membangun jejaring layanan prioritas. Selain juga ada apa kerjasama dengan Academic Health System, kemudian juga kita membangun sistem rujukan yang terintegrasi berbasis kompetensi dan tidak kalah pentingnya adalah yang prahospital kita bangun penanganan kedaruratan dengan kode 119. Kemudian Bapak Ibu lanjut terkait sertifikasi dan jejaring pengampuan layanan prioritas. Nah di sini poinnya kami berupaya mengidentifikasi kompetensi rumah sakit manakah dalam 10 layanan prioritas itu dan kita melakukan setelah identifikasi melakukan pembentukan jejaring pengampuan bersama rumah sakit-rumah sakit pengampu yang sudah ditunjuk di dalam keputusan Menteri Kesehatan. Kita identifikasi masalah kenapa 10 penyakit prioritas karena masalah kesehatan yang kita identifikasi ini ada jantung, stroke, kanker, ginjal, ibu anak, TB, penyakit infeksi emerging, diabetes mellitus, gastrohepatologi, dan kesehatan jiwa. Ini hasil identifikasi kenapa kita uh, apa uh, 10, 10 yang penyakit prioritas yang kita pilih. Nah, terkait akses dan mutu, nah ini memang kita juga mengidentifikasi beberapa rumah sakit rumah sakit itu kompetensinya masing-masing belum merata. Ditambah lagi sistem rujukannya pun belum optimal sampai saat ini. Dan yang sangat terpenting sekali itu keterbatasannya sarpras dan alat kesehatan, terutama di daerah-daerah yang DTPK, daerah terpencil, kepulauan, pegunungan, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, tentunya kita dengan dengan berupaya untuk meningkatkan akses dan mutu layanan, kita membentuk stratifikasi dan pembentukan jejaring pengampuan. Harapannya adalah angka kesakitan, angka kematian pun menurun, kemudian juga biaya pada penyakit-penyakit permasalahan kesehatan yang prioritas, di mana di dalamnya juga ada beberapa penyakit yang katastrofik yang memerlukan biaya tinggi, kita harapkan ada costing pembiayaan yang menurun. Harapannya lagi adalah peningkatan produktivitas dan kualitas hidup masyarakatnya di seluruh Indonesia. Nah, langkah-langkahnya ini kita lihat ada beberapa langkah-langkah, yaitu bermula dari penentuan rumah sakit pengampu utama. Siapa saja rumah sakit pengampu utama? Kita lihat berdasarkan kompetensi SDM, layanan, kelengkapan sarpras maupun alat-alat kesehatan. Setelah kita menentukan rumah sakit pengampu utama, lalu kita melaksanakan pemetaan kompetensi rumah sakit ke dalam strata kompetensi. Strata kompetensi itu mulai dasar, madya, utama maupun sampai dengan paripurna. Nah, kemudian setelah itu kita membentuk jejaring pengampuan sesuai dengan strata kompetensinya. Nah, hal ini eh, kita lalu menetapkan atau menentukan target pengampuan, pelaksanaan pengampuan, yang mana hal ini sudah kita eh, jalankan dan sudah kita tentukan lokus-lokus mana di tahap pertama yang merupakan eh, masuk rumah sakit-rumah sakit ke dalam lokus eh, stratifikasi dan jejaring pengampuan layanan prioritas. Harapan kami dari Kementerian Kesehatan dengan adanya stratifikasi dan jejaring pengampuan layanan prioritas ini tentunya makin meningkatnya kompetensi rumah sakit yang diampu dalam penanganan penyakit prioritas. Di samping, di samping upaya dari kami, Direktorat Jenderal Pelayanan Kesehatan tentunya juga ada dari Direktorat Jenderal tenaga kesehatan yang kita sama-sama saling paralel dengan menyiapkan SDM di mana di Jenakes membuka kran terkait beasiswa pendidikan, pelatihan maupun 
penempatan-penempatan SDM-SDM uh, kompeten sesuai dengan uh, stratifikasinya ke daerah-daerah. Ya, lanjut. Ya, Bapak Ibu, uh, ini Rumah Sakit Jaring Pengampuan Layanan itu kanker, jantung, stroke dan ginjal atau uronefro yang kita singkat KJSU ya. Itu mem mem memiliki tahapan-tahapan. Tahapan pertama itu 2022 sampai 2024. Tahapan kedua adalah 2025 sampai dengan 2027. Tahapan pertama ini sebenarnya tidak hanya KJSU saja, kanker jantung, stroke, uronefro atau ginjal saja. Namun ada enam layanan enam layanan juga yang sedang berjalan seperti itu ya. KIA tadi, kesehatan ibu anak, tuberkulosis respirasi, kemudian juga diabetes mellitus, gastrospato, kemudian juga penyakit infeksi emerging maupun juga kesehatan jiwa. Nah, pembagiannya ini tahap pertama itu di mana kita atur rumah sakit utama di seluruh provinsi ditambah rumah sakit madya di 50 persen kabupaten kota untuk tahap pertama. Nah, bagaimana kriterianya? Kalau untuk rumah sakit yang kita sebut stratifikasi utama, di mana kita tentukan satu provinsi memiliki satu rumah sakit utama. Bagaimana dengan uh, provinsi yang memiliki rumah sakit lebih dari satu? Nah, tentunya kita pilih nah, mana rumah sakit di provinsi tersebut uh, yang akan uh, mereka kembangkan. Nah, tentunya kita selain dengan dinas kesehatan provinsi uh, berkoordinasi juga dengan uh, pemerintah provinsinya. Nah, untuk menentukan rumah sakit milik provinsi sebagai rumah sakit serata utama, nah, itu yang mana rumah sakitnya. Kemudian untuk rumah sakit-rumah sakit yang serata madya, itu kita pilih 50 persen rumah sakit di kabupaten kota yang ada di dalam satu provinsi. Nah, pendekatannya pemilihan yang madya ini, satu adalah kita melihat populasi terbesar yang ada. Kemudian kita juga men melakukan pendekatan geospasial. Kemudian yang ketiga, rumah sakit pemi pemiliknya adalah uh, pemerintah daerah di kabupaten kota dengan tipe tertinggi atau kelas yang tertinggi. Kemudian juga tentunya kita uh, mempertimbangkan rekomendasi dari dinas kesehatan. Dari sekian banyak rumah sakit yang ada di wilayah dinas kesehatan, baik itu provinsi maupun uh, dinas kesehatan kabupaten kota, mana yang memang kira-kira untuk lokus pertama ini yang memenuhi syarat berdasarkan pendekatan tersebut. Gitu ya. Nah, jika di kabupaten kota dengan 50 persen populasinya terbanyak, memiliki satu rumah sakit saja, maka yang dipilih hanya satu rumah sakit. Contohnya begini, misalnya di eh, di Provinsi A, ada dari 10 kabupaten di Provinsi A, maka untuk lokus tahap pertama 2022 sampai 2024, kita pilih eh, 5 kabupaten kota. Seperti itu. Nah, Bapak Ibu yang terhormat yang bergabung di dalam link Zoom maupun yang luring bahwa kita sudah juga mengidentifikasi, menjaring masukan-masukan eh, dari berbagai daerah khususnya pemerintah provinsi, dinas kesehatan eh, provinsi, eh, kabupaten, kota maupun juga dari rumah sakit-rumah sakit untuk um, um, membuka tahap kedua yaitu 2025 sampai 2027 mana saja rumah sakit rumah sakit yang masuk ke dalam uh, lokus uh, tahap kedua sesuai dengan persyaratan yang kita kita apa sampaikan 
Jadi tetap aja ketentuannya di tahap kedua, rumah sakit utama di seluruh provinsi plus rumah sakit madya sisanya yang 50% di kabupaten kota di seluruh provinsi. Jadi harapannya dari 2022 sampai 2027 untuk uh, rumah sakit di kabupaten kota tercapai 100% loh, yang masuk ke dalam lokus. Artinya kalau ada 10 ya tentunya di tahap kedua sampailah 10 rumah sakit tersebut. Nah, ketentuannya pun sama rumah sakit utama maupun madya di mana satu provinsi memiliki satu rumah sakit utama. Kalau yang memang lebih dari satu provinsi satu rumah sakit di provinsi tersebut kita pilih mana yang mau dikembangkan di provinsi itu itu yang kita laksanakan. Begitupun juga 50% sisanya. Iya, lanjut. Untuk Bapak, waktunya sudah habis. Boleh oh. dipersingkat mungkin penyampaiannya? Oke, okay, baik. Jadi ini dasar pelayanan kanker ini ada keputusan Menteri Kesehatan nomor 1337 2023 tentang Rumah Sakit Jejaring Pengampuan Pelayanan Kanker. Ya, sudah ada payung hukumnya, lokus-lokusnya siapa aja di sana sudah ada. Ya, lanjut. Nah, ini ada ketentuan satu rumah sakit pengampun nasional sebagai koordinator pengampun. Nah, koordinator pengampuan untuk rumah sakit uh, untuk, uh, untuk kanker adalah rumah sakit kanker darmais sebagai rumah sakit pengampun nasional atau sebagai koordinator pengampun. Kalau untuk rumah sakit pengampun regional, itu ada beberapa. Di wilayah DIY ada rumah sakit Sagito sebagai rumah sakit pengampu regional. Nah, ini ada di uh, beberapa provinsi. Nah, ini pengampu regional ini bisa rumah sakit umum daerah, bisa juga rumah sakit umum uh, pusat, begitu ya. Kemudian ada rumah sakit yang diampu, di mana kalau yang diampu itu uh, belum mempunyai pelayanan dasar yang prioritas, kemudian masih belum sesuai standar. Sarpras, Alkes, maupun SDM serta pelayanannya. Ya, lanjut. Ya. Nah, untuk sertifikasi jejaring layanan kanker, ini Bapak Ibu bisa lihat yang di garis apa sebelah kanan ini, kriteria rumah sakit utama dan rumah sakit paripurna. Terkait kompetensi bahwa rumah sakit utama mampu melakukan bedah tumor lanjut terapi sistemik dan terapi radiasi. Jadi manajemen kanker dengan cara multidisiplin. Kalau untuk yang jenjang paripurna tentunya dia akan lebih tinggi lagi dia bisa uh, mikro uh, surgery, kedokteran nuklir, transplantasi, uh, karti sel terapi, tomoterapi, proton terapi. Seperti itu dan ini multidisiplin juga. Kemudian untuk kebutuhan alkes dan SDM, nah, tentunya untuk kriteria rumah sakit utama itu ada CT scan minimal 128 punya esperat, MR satu setengah tesla, punya spek CT, SPKN, apoteker dan ada flow sitometer, CT simulator, inek dan brachyterapi. Nah untuk paripurna itu kita arahkan ada PET scan dan CT Lotron dan Next Generation NGS ya, emikroskop bedah. Nah ini sertifikasi untuk layanan kanker yang kita tetapkan bersama Rumah Sakit uh, Pengampu uh, Nasional dan juga uh, beberapa uh, li yang kita undang. Ya lanjut. Nah ini regulasi-regulasi pelayanan kedokteran nuklir. Tentunya Bapak Ibu bisa lihat dari apa regulasi mulai dari Permenke, Perbapeten, Perbapepom, dan lain sebagainya. Ya, lanjut. Ya, Bapak Ibu, uh, sikloton di Indonesia itu uh, yang terdata dari kami ada empat. Namun di antara empat itu yang telah memiliki izin Bapeten adalah tiga. Kanker Darmais, MRCC Siloam, sama Rumah Sakit Gading Pluit. Sementara Abdul Wahab Sarani belum uh, memiliki izin BAPT. Jadi siklotron bisa dilihat di sini. Kemudian untuk sebaran PET scan, Bapak Ibu bisa lihat di sini ada Rumah Sakit Kanker Darmais, Ipto Mangun Kusumo, Hasan Sadikin, Silam dan 
rumah sakit gading peluit. Iya, lanjut. Iya. Nah, terkait SDM pelayanan kedokteran nuklir, kita mensyaratkan bahwa tenaga medisnya adalah dokter SPKN atau dokter sub kedokteran nuklir dengan kualifikasi atau dengan kualifikasi tambahan. Tenaga kesehatannya mulai dari sarjana atau D3 perawat dengan pelatihan pendidikan khusus, kedokteran nuklir, ada radiografa, teknologi kedokteran nuklir, radiofarmasis, fisikawan medis spesialis yang khusus PET scan dan siklotron, teknisi elektromedik, kemudian petugas PPPR level 1 dan petugas keamanan sumber radioaktif. Nah, itu persyaratannya lanjut. Ya, ya ada nanti bisa dibaca Permenkes nomor 1248 tahun 2009 tentang pedoman penyelenggaraan siklotan di rumah sakit, di mana di sini itu penyelenggaraan siklotan untuk keperluan pelayanan pendidikan penelitian, kemudian penyelenggaraan siklotan meliputi produk radionuklida dan pembuatan radiofarmaka, kemudian juga terkait keselamatan dan pengangkutan harus ada izin dari Bapeten dan mengikuti CPOB dari BPOM. Izin penyelenggaraan dari Menkes asal memenuhi persyaratan sarpras jenis sikloton dan kemampuan rumah sakit. Ya, lanjut. Nah, terkait Permenkes nomor 14 2021 tentang standar penyelenggaraan pelayanan kedokteran nuklir, ada persyaratan umum, Bapak Ibu bisa lihat di sini bagaimana persyaratan perpanjangannya bisa dilihat. Kemudian juga ada persyaratan khususnya terkait SBS, IP, dokumen organisasi, SPO, daftar SDM, dan lain sebagainya. Ya, lanjut. Ada petanya juga. Nah, proyeksi mapping siklotron. Jadi di Indonesia, rumah sakit yang memiliki siklotron yang sudah operasional hanya tiga. Dan satu lagi, yang nomor empat adalah Wapsarani, itu masih dalam proses perizinan BAPT. Dan mapping PET scan, rumah sakit jajaran pengampulan dan kanker dengan strata paripurna untuk PET scan. Beberapa rumah sakit jajaran pengampulan dan kanker, strata utama ada di pulau besar dan tidak memiliki rumah sakit dengan strata paripurna. Mapping kami seperti itu, dan penambahan pelayan di beberapa rumah sakit swasta. Kemudian perencanaan pengadaan siklator mengikuti mapping PET CT scan, bekerja sama dengan pihak swasta dan BUMN. Inilah proyeksi-proyeksi mapping siklotron dari arah dari pimpinan. Ya, lanjut. Nah, ini berikut uh, proyeksi mapping, PET scan, dan siklotron. Bapak-Ibu lihat di bagian uh, atas ada keterangan. Rumah sakit pemerintah operasional PET CT scan hanya ada rumah sakit kanker dan lain luar kedudukan di DKI Jakarta. Kemudian ada rumah sakit yang belum operasional PET CT scan PET scan PET CT-nya yaitu satu Cipto Mangkusumo kedudukan Jakarta Asad Sadikin di Jawa Barat kemudian ada Abdul Wahab Sarani di Kalimantan Timur gitu ya. Nah, kemudian di sini ada rumah sakit pemerintah direncanakan memiliki PET CT. Nah, ini ada beberapa yaitu Mulai dari Pulau Sumatera, ada ada Malik, Menda, M. Jamil, Padang, kemudian M. Pusin, Palembang. Kemudian di Jawa ada Fatmawati, Persahabatan, Jakarta, Jawa Tengah, Klaten, dan Karyadi, Semarang. Untuk Jawa Timur ada Sutomo. Kemudian yang di Bali ada Prokura, gitu ya, dan NTC Kupang. Sulawesi, Wahidin, dan Maluku, Jelimena, serta uh, Papua untuk rumah sakit Jayapura. Kalau untuk Sulawesi, Kandau di utara juga. Dan Kalimantan Barat, untuk di Kalimantan Barat ada uh, rumah sakit Sudarso. Itu rumah sakit pemerintah direncanakan memiliki pet city. Nah, bagaimana dengan rumah sakit swasta yang sudah beroperasional? Ada dua tadi, Gading Fluid dan MRCC. Uh, Siloam. Nah, rumah sakit swasta yang direncanakan memiliki pet city ada beberapa, yaitu uh, 
Siluam Palembang, kemudian Buddha Suci di Jakarta eh, PIK, Siloam di eh, Jawa Barat, Rumah Sakit Indri Jati Jawa Tengah, ada IHC, Pertamedika, dan Siloam di eh, ada yang di Bali dan ada yang di Jawa Timur. Ya, kiranya itu yang bisa saya sampaikan. Terima kasih atas atensi Bapak Ibu sekalian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you Dr. Budi Surya Dharma uh, for your opening session that has delivered about the Indonesia policy on cyclotron. So for the next session is the fundamental building block for molecular diagnostics and therapeutic that will be delivered uh, from Pak Hans Wijaya. For Pak Hans Vijaya, the time is just 10 minutes. I hope you can deliver the presentation uh, as brief uh, as possible. I'm sorry for the limitation. Uh, for Pak Hans Vijaya, the time is yours. Ya, yeah, sudah terdengar ya. Sudah, okay. Pak. Baik, terima kasih Ibu MC. Waktu saya coba singkat saja untuk memberikan background kepada bagaimana challenge dan pitfalls dari uh, molecular diagnostic and therapy yang merupakan bagian dari uh, uh, masalah yang saya kira cukup bisa menarik untuk kita diskusikan pada pagi ini ya. Kacamata saya adalah dari operator dan pengguna ini dari sisi rumah sakit di lapangan. Uh, studi kasusnya adalah mengenai PET scan penyebarannya di Indonesia, kenapa yang sudah mungkin 15 tahun ada di Indonesia dengan 270 juta penduduk, tapi sampai saat ini jumlahnya baru ada tiga dan terkonsentrasi di Jakarta, sementara yang lain masih belum beroperasi. Saya kira ini akan menjadi satu case study yang menarik untuk kita diskusikan sebelum nanti akan kita lihat para pembicara lainnya melakukan benchmark dengan di Australia. Ini Kategorinya, jadi kalau kita lihat bahwa molecular diagnostik itu bicara mengenai bagian dari precision medicine, bagaimana diagnosa ditegakkan dan ditentukan di level uh, sel, dan merupakan PET juga merupakan bagian dari uh, molecular diagnostik. Gitu. Saya skip saja, jadi kalau kita lihat mudahnya begini, kalau di gambar sebelah kiri, yang sebelah kiri ini adalah gambar CT scan image, sementara yang sebelah kanan yang ada warna merahnya itu adalah PET CT, yang mana kita bisa lihat kalau CT scan itu hanya menggambarkan anatomiknya, sementara dari PET CT itu kelihatan uh, apa namanya biochemistry proses yang ada di sel, yang mana sel yang merah itu akan menunjukkan bahwa ada penyerapan glukos yang lebih besar dibanding sel-sel normal yang biasanya terjadi pada sel abnormal, utamanya kanker. Nah, salah satu yang menarik adalah perbedaan ini bisa dipicu dengan adanya injeksi radiofarmaka, yaitu FDG, Fludioxy Glucose, 18F kodenya, yang disingkat populernya itu adalah FDG yang dibuat oleh satu mesin yang namanya cyclotron. Jadi kalau kita lihat di foto sebelah kanan, ini seperti salah satu perangkat yang mana untuk early detection. Kalau perangkat kita ada mobil teknologi terkini, sebelum pengemudinya mengantuk, itu biasanya ada tension, ada indikator, setirnya bergetar ataupun ada alarm, ini menandakan bahwa akan ada terjadi bahaya. Nah, seperti ini juga, teraplikasi di PET scan sebelum sel-sel kanker itu berubah secara anatomical itu bisa terdeteksi secara seluler dengan adanya deteksi PET scan sehingga kegunaannya adalah untuk early diagnostic untuk monitoring dari terapi apakah terapinya berhasil atau tidak dan untuk research sih poin saya ada tiga saya coba sampaikan masing-masing secara sangat singkat ya apakah yang pertama is it the time untuk Indonesia mulai melihat bahwa uh, apa namanya eskalasi atau percepatan pertumbuhan dari PET scan yang kedua kenapa selama ini perkembangannya begitu lambat dan apa langkah-langkah yang diperlukan ya tadi 
uh, Dr. Budi sudah menyampaikan mengenai background-nya bagaimana kondisi yang ada di Indonesia. Ini menarik bahwa cancer adalah salah satu top three killer dari mortality case di rumah sakit. Ya. Uh, dan yang menarik lagi bahwa insidens ini bertumbuh lebih cepat dibanding penyakit lain. Tadi datanya sudah disampaikan oleh Dr. Budi. Kalau di foto sebelah kanan, foto kondisi seperti ini sangat umum terjadi di pusat-pusat kanker, di rumah sakit rujukan, ya di rumah sakit paripurna maupun rumah sakit utama, yang mana kondisi kita lihat dari jauh saja udah nggak membutuhkan PET scan, ini akan terlihat bahwa ada diagnosa, ada benjolan di secara morfologik gitu ya. Sementara kalau di luar negeri kita lihat kasus atau foto seperti ini sangat jarang terjadi, di mana diagnosa dilakukan di level yang lebih uh, early. Nah ini saya kira kondisi yang cukup tragis yang ada di Indonesia. Sementara yang ketiga adalah kebanyakan rata-rata diagnosa awal dari uh, tumor atau cancer ini sudah pada stadium yang cukup lanjut, bahkan pada stadium terminal. Dan ini berdampak pada uh, pembiayaan kesehatan yang semakin besar, di mana kita biasa di Indonesia polanya adalah higher cost for of medication, but low cost in the diagnostic. Ya. Jadi uang beredarnya lebih dipakai untuk kuratif daripada preventif, yang mana ini akan menimbulkan beban kesehatan yang semakin tinggi selain uh, angka mortalitas yang juga semakin tinggi. Ya. Dari sini, poinnya adalah kita membutuhkan transformasi karena datanya tiga PET CT scan yang sudah beroperasi di Jakarta dan ini mewakili seluruh Indonesia. Kenapa pertanyaannya baru ada tiga dan sangat sedikit ada rumah sakit terutama swasta untuk berkembang untuk layanan PET CT scan? Yang pertama adalah investment. Investmentnya sangat besar dan setiap kali investment PET scan juga harus dilakukan dengan investment cyclotron yang satu setengah kali lebih besar daripada investment PET scan-nya. Yang kedua harga jualnya, yang mana harga jualnya karena investmentnya besar, volumenya nggak terlalu banyak, ini membuat price jadi semakin tinggi. Yang kedua bahwa uh, pasar yang selama ini mm, menengah atas ya, itu memilih untuk pergi ke negara-negara lain, terutamanya Singapura dan Malaysia untuk mendapatkan layanan PET scan. Jadi menariknya adalah tiga PET scan masih underutilized di Indonesia, tapi banyak pasar pergi ke Singapura dan Malaysia, bahkan ada rumah sakit yang khusus menerima pasien-pasien Indonesia yang ada di Pulau Pinang. Nah, untuk PET scan. Masalahnya adalah price and consistency. Harganya tidak berbeda jauh dengan yang ada di Indonesia, bahkan kadang-kadang bisa lebih murah daripada di Indonesia kalau itu ada di Malaysia, dan konsisten. Uh, uptime-nya tinggi, sementara di Indonesia karena maintenance-nya mungkin atau karena cyclotron ini cukup kompleks, uh, downtime-nya cukup tinggi. Dan yang ketiga adalah bahwa kebanyakan yang menikmati layanan PET scan untuk saat ini adalah pasien-pasien private insurance dan pasien-pasien out of pocket sementara BPJS belum memfokuskan untuk uh, layanan PET scan. Ini faktanya kalau kita lihat data-data yang cukup menarik ini angka ya harga prosedur kalau dibandingkan Indonesia dengan Australia, harga PET scan di Australia ternyata jauh lebih murah dibanding harga di Indonesia, kurang lebih setengahnya. Di sana satu prosedur PET scan hanya sekitar 900 sampai 1100, sementara di Indonesia 1300 yang paling murah sampai 2300, mirip-mirip dengan di Singapura saya kira. Downtime-nya menarik, downtime di Indonesia sekitar 20-an persen, ini data di lapangan karena saya cukup memahami beberapa fasilitas yang ada di Jakarta saat ini. Sementara di Australia itu kurang dari 10 persen, kebanyakan hanya di bawah 5 persen. Yang ketiga, investment cost alatnya kurang lebih mirip-mirip antara Indonesia dengan Australia untuk alat PET scan-nya saja di tiga setengah juta, belum dengan cyclotron. Kalau dengan cyclotron biasanya satu setengah kalinya ditambahin. Nah, menariknya adalah untuk memproduksi FDG yang tadi radiofarmaka tadi di Indonesia itu ternyata unit cost-nya di sekitar 600 Australian dollar, sementara kalau di Australia hanya 250 sampai 375. Kenapa nih pertanyaannya nih? 
apakah karena memang scale, apakah karena volume, ataukah memang secara teknologi lebih lean. Dan volume yang ada sekarang hanya antara 2-6 per fasilitas per hari, sementara di Australia per fasilitas itu 10-15 uh, tes per hari. Di Australia ada 100 sekian unit PET scan yang melayani 25 juta penduduk. ya. Sehingga masuk kepada poin yang kedua, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, apa nih kendalanya? ya? Kendalanya yang pertama bahwa ya saya kira yang paling penting di sini adalah semua PET scan uh, unit di Indonesia harus memiliki, memiliki dedicated cyclotron, yang mana satu, biasanya satu cyclotron itu merupakan sharing facilities untuk beberapa PET scan. Sehingga economies of scale ini menjadi masalah utama. Yang kedua, belum ada regulasi yang cukup adekuat untuk mendistribusi FDG tadi. Itulah kenapa harus ada di rumah sakit. Jadi uh, belum cukup jelas ini bagaimana aturan untuk mendistribusikan uh, FDG ini jika ada sharing facilities. Dan yang kedua juga kita lihat apakah itu harus ada di rumah sakit produksinya atau itu bisa diproduksi di luar rumah sakit. Yang ketiga adalah high price. Obstacle yang ketiga karena ini high price, maka volumenya juga hanya sedikit dan hanya pasar tertentu yang bisa menikmatinya. Sehingga konsekuensinya adalah membuat pertumbuhan PET scan yang sangat lambat di Indonesia. Sementara terjadi pertumbuhan yang cukup tinggi untuk PET scan market dari Indonesia pergi ke luar negeri. Ini saya kira sangat kontras dan menjadi satu poin yang Uh, UGM menangkap ini sebagai satu upaya yang menjadi prioritas kami sangat apresiasi. Yang ketiga, steps needed-nya, saya kira poin pentingnya bagaimana sharing facilities of cyclotron ini bisa diupayakan dalam rangka membuat aksesibilitas PET scan ini semakin besar di masyarakat Indonesia. ya. Bukan hanya yang pasien-pasien kaya saja, tapi termasuk uh, bisa untuk pasien-pasien yang di uh, social insurance. Ya. Saya kira poin itu untuk kita lihat bahwa perlu benchmark dengan negara lain. Yang kedua, saya kira perlu ada regulasi yang cukup relevan dengan kondisi yang sesuai dengan tuntutan zaman saat ini. Kita harus merubah bisnis model yang high price tadi menjadi low price, tapi high volume and reliability. Saya kira begitu ini terjadi akan cukup banyak rumah sakit swasta dan pemerintah, terutama yang swasta, itu berkeinginan untuk memiliki layanan non PET scan jika terjadi kemudahan-kemudahan di dalam fasilitas distribusi dari PET scan. Dan poin keempat adalah bagaimana ini bisa affordable untuk public insurance in the future. Saya kira itu pengantar singkat dari saya sebagai background. Saya kira ini satu quotes yang cukup relevan kalau situasi sudah berubah, saya kira kita harus juga memiliki cara mengantisipasi dan bisnis model yang juga berbeda. Terima kasih, uh, Ibu MC. Mudah-mudahan bermanfaat. Oke, okay, thank you so much, Pak Answijaya, for the opening session about the fundamental building block for molecular diagnostic and therapeutic. Also, the uh, obstacles and also the opportunity about the development of implementation of radiopharmaceutical in Indonesia. So for the next session, there will be a background, a delivery of the background and introduction, a brief introduction from our blog, Professor Laksono Trisnantoro, uh, our professor from uh, Health Policy and Medicine, uh, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada. For Professor Laksono, the time is yours. Good morning, everybody. Selamat pagi dan assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can you hear me, Ibu? Yes. Yes, we can hear yes. you. I think um, we have uh, heard from two speakers, uh, from MOH, policy makers, and then from Pak Hans. Okay. Jadi sekarang kita akan masuk pada diskusi yang uh, sebelumnya memang kita akan undang dulu ya uh, para tamu dari Australia. Kalau tadi sudah disebutkan di awal bahwa memang Um, hari ini kita membahas uh, perbandingan dengan di Australia dan bagaimana Australia bisa berkembang begitu cepat. Oke, okay. uh, tolong diklik ya. <tuh> Jadi di sini um, tadi disebutkan mengenai cyclotron sebagai sebuah infrastruktur untuk pelayanan inovatif cancer ya, dan ini sangat dibutuhkan oleh Indonesia dengan penduduk yang sangat 
banyak sekali ya 225 juta tapi ya baru ada uh, tiga ya right. kalau kita lihat uh, memang ini inovasi ini yang menurut WHO itu uh, bisa dalam konteks uh, kebijakan sistem produk dan teknologi serta pelayanan serta cara memberi pelayanan ya nah ini yang menjadi hal isu bahwa Cycloton itu itu inovatif ya termasuk PET scan ya, ya yang bisa meningkatkan kesehatan masyarakat tapi ya di ada satu hal yang menarik ya nanti yang kita akan bahas apakah uh, Cycloton dan uh, semua hal terkait itu apakah untuk semua lapisan masyarakat atau hanya yang mampu bayar ya, ya slide kenapa <tuh> jadi kalau kita lihat prinsip dari inovasi itu itu memang uh, harus ada inovasi ya, ya jelas ya. Dan inovasi kita memang ketinggalan dibanding di Australia yang nanti kita akan lihat sangat cepat berkembang. Dan tadi eh, Pak Hans juga sudah menyatakan bahwa dalam konteks eh, rupiah dan juga frekuensi penggunaan ya, itu eh, apa yang ada di Indonesia itu masih mahal ya dan masih sedikit penggunaannya. Jadi dalam inovasi itu ada satu hal yang sangat kunci yaitu scaling, yaitu perluasan perluasan tadi. Nah, ini ini satu isu kunci ya. Perluasan ke masyarakat tadi. Scaling. Oke, okay. slide. <tuh> nah, dalam dalam uh, inovasi ini ada buku dari USAID yang menyatakan bahwa uh, head impact-nya harus kelihatan ya, kemudian demand and sustainability-nya, kemudian kapasitas sini nih, organisasi dan partnernya ya dalam industri kesehatan. Nah, kemudian progression to skill. Jadi, yang saya lihat saat ini itu memang ada suatu rasa bahwa scaling kita perluasan dari teknologi yang inovatif ini agak lambat itu ya nah sehingga pertemuan hari ini kita berusaha untuk mempelajari sistem di Australia dan ini juga mungkin ada kita lihat tawaran dari perusahaan Australia untuk tadi progresnya itu bisa cepat nggak nih nggak masuk masalah regulatory dan teknologi yang menjadi penghambat untuk scaling ini ya slide berikutnya. <tuh> ya, jadi ini kalau kita cermati nanti akan ada <tuh> uh, presentasi dari Australia. So, I think uh, our friends from Australia will talk about uh, many things and this is like the history of uh, cyclotron in in in, uh, in Australian setting uh, since 2002, now is 2023. Okay, so it, the graph uh, in the right is so impressive that Uh, the increase is so quick ya, jadi cepat sekali uh, naiknya ya ini. Ya, slide berikutnya. Nah, pertanyaannya siapa yang membiayai inovasi ini? Who will finance the innovation? Ya. Is there uh, only from market forces or from the government? Ya, slide. Ya, karena pertanyaannya memang menjadi ini ya, apakah ini jadi satu commercial innovation ya dengan basis pasar? Ya, slide berikutnya. Atau ini juga ada dukungan dari filantropi atau pemerintah atau kerjasama bilateral atau multilateral ini. Nah ini, jadi ini tetap satu pertanyaan yang klasik ya, siapa yang akan mendanai ini? Ya, slide. Nah di Indonesia kalau kita lebih fokus lagi, siapa yang biayai? Apakah pemerintah? Dan apakah BPJS itu mampu juga untuk uh, menjadi semacam bagian dari sumber dana untuk ini atau? betul sumber swasta nih. Nah ini yang jadi satu isu kunci yang kita harus melihat ke depannya bagaimana kalau karena tanpa ada perhitungan uh, ekonominya termasuk sumber dananya itu uh, pengembangan tadi progres untuk scaling tadi bisa uh, juga lambat ya. ya. Slide. Terakhir, mari kita pelajari apa yang terjadi di uh, Australia ya. Nah untuk itu uh, kita akan undang ya. Uh, presentator dari top center dari uh, Australia dari Cyclopack. So I will invite uh, itu ada ya Bapak Greg Santa Maria. Are you there or Bapak John Evans? Halo. Hi Alexander, it's Greg Santa Maria. Oh, who, who will speak? Yep, I'll start off. I'll just share my screen. Okay. Um, Mr. Santa Maria. Okay, Pak Greg. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm just uh, okay. Yes, yes, okay. So, uh, 
Pak Greg, Pak Greg Santa Maria, he is the Group Chief Executive Officer uh, for Cyclotech. It's a center or group that uh, the main business is for cyclotron. So you know the cyclotech, yeah. And then uh, it's uh, Santa Maria. You will speak about the molecular imaging and therapy group. Yeah. So this is the first uh, paper, and then we will have the second one is about how the prospect of Indonesians uh, uh, scaling up of the uh, cyclotron. Okay. Please, uh, Mr. Santa Maria, the time is yours. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, a pleasure to be. Um, uh, speaking with you all on uh, the capability of developing Indonesia's nuclear medicine or radiopharmaceutical business. Um, Cyclotech, we define ourselves now because uh, we, we, we've always been a patient-centric company, but we've decided that we're developed at a point now where we're concept to care. So as Luxano presented in his other page, creativity and innovation, um, Cyclotech's now in a lot more of the development of um, new uh, radiopharmaceuticals to take all the way through to clinical trials. So we've refined ourselves as a concept care company. Um, this slide here, are the, what uh, for me as a CEO of Cyclotech, these are my four principles that I am chasing and developing um, as the industry in Australia has grown from its infancy days, um, where we're looking at new isotopes. So fluorine is predominantly the main radioisotope and FDG uh, is the main radiopharmaceutical that is being used globally. And I think in Cyclotech's context, about 90, 93 to 94% of our total turnover is in FDG. But what's happening is we're moving slowly down where I think in the next five years, FDG would probably make up about 87% of our, of our business whilst the other radioisotopes start to flourish in both diagnostics and therapeutics. Cyclotech's also involved in, um, in licensing technology from other companies. We've been successful with a PSMA fluorinated agent that has been launched in Australia. Uh, it's been in Australia for five years and it's, it's growing at around about 50% per year at the moment. We, all do, we also do things like CDMO, which stands for Contract Development Manufacturing Organisation, where we take other people's products who are going through clinical trial phases and we allow them to uh, participate in Australia by making the radio pharmaceutical accessible um, under the sponsor's uh, quality regime. Um, all Cyclotex facilities manufacture a GMP-based product based on um, quality standards and uh, pharmaceutical guidelines. And we'll go through that a little bit more later in the slides. The bottom part is uh, an exciting area that in the last five years, uh, Radio Pharmaceuticals has extensively taken off in the industry, not just from FDG, but all the way through to antibodies, small molecules, peptides, uh, different radioisotopes, zirconium, copper 64, lutetium, terbium and, and now lead. So the industry has an enormous uh, scope to develop, um, but Cyclotech's taken 15 years of doing the basics. And in the last five years, it's it's really hottened up the, uh, the uh, discovery programs that are available now. And one of the key things that I'm very passionate about is indus industry skills and knowledge. Um, to have a vibrant radio pharmaceutical industry, and it is very small in Australia, um, we still lack um, industry skills in um, students coming through um, and building up a knowledge pool. Um, I've been in the game for 20 years, um, but a lot of the staff here are probably in their seven and eight years. So scope for uh, developing people's knowledge is, is critical in this industry. Very quick summary, our diagnostic business arm, we are regulated by the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia and in New Zealand, uh, the Ministry of Health, together with radiation compliance from both um, state government levels like Victorian government, Queensland government, but also the federal government, the Australian government. We have six facilities, eight cyclotrons, 95 staff now, uh, and a suite of products that we manufacture for both routine clinical use and also extensively in clinical trials. Our therapeutic business, um, again, we're TGA and um, Australian government, state government compliant in the requirements. 
we access the ANSTO, the, the Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organisation. They have an opal reactor and we access their lutetium NCA um, as the main product. We are now looking at third parties from overseas to supply lutetium into Australia so that we can export. We have 10 staff in there and at the moment we have two products, one being for PSMA and the other one being for dotatate for neuroendocrine tumours. One of the key things, and, and I've heard in the conversations before, um, regulators, um, methods, methodology of logistics, and, and they resonate here on this strategic relationship that I hold, as in regulators, logistics, service providers, and universities. And universities, you could substitute for skilled workforce. Um, and those relationships, I'll talk about regulators and logistics later, but those four key uh, strategic relationships are important to a high output uh, radiopharmaceutical facility. So what are the regulations um, uh, within the Australian context? And they're the, um, the Therapeutic Goods Act and the um, for the radiation side of things, it's the federal and state statutory bodies. And both those federal and state bodies actually operate under a um, um, uh, an Australian government organisation called the Australian Radiation Protection and Safety Agency, APANSA. And that's the lead agency that the other bodies actually refer back up to. So what I was going to do is get Mark Frazetto to tag team with me a little bit on this slide. So Mark, would you like to jump in on the, the products and the radiation? You there, Mark? You're muted. There we go. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for a second. Um, so yes, as as Greg was uh, mentioning, we're we're regulated by the Therapeutic Goods Act. Um, one of the uh, the key components of the Therapeutic Goods Act is uh, is uh, um, alignment with the um, Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, which is uh, which is known as Joint, and that's some. Um, leading the international developments and implementation of um, harmonising GMP standards across uh, and quality systems across the um, field of medicinal products. Um, Indonesia is, is in fact a member of, of the, uh, the PICS uh, um, scheme. Um, it's, uh, Cyclotech has built its um, pharmaceutical um, quality system in alignment with um, PICS and that evolves with updates and interpretation of guidance that's provided by the EGU by the regulators. Um, and that, that's solely um, with respect to the product. With respect to radiation, as Greg mentioned earlier, um, that is uh, guided by the IAEA for um, uh, safe transport of the um, radioactive materials. And Indonesia is actually um, one of the early members of the IA, IAEA regulations from since 1957. Along with that, uh, we're also regulated by the International Air Transport Association and Psychotech is uh, in, in compliance with that as well. Next slide, please, Greg. So what I was going to give you here is a bit of a, a, a journey of Cyclotech and uh, uh, um, Luxano presented some of the achievements that Cyclotech's done over the years, but this is a little bit different. But basically in 1999, uh, Cyclot um, uh, Australia was in its infancy of PET with four PET CT cameras. And, and I say 2.2 because there were two proper cyclotrons and a very small one um, in Australia with a population around about 22 million. And then Cyclotech made the decision with, I think I spent three years trying to work out a business plan where we could actually set up a facility with no government support. So it took me a few years to figure it out, but we did figure out a, a means to actually set up the first cyclotron facility. So there was a commitment made in 2000 and with that came an, an interesting paradigm. By 2000, uh, 2001, we had multiple public hospitals and private operators seeking entry into the PET CT market because Cyclotech announced in 2000 that it would set up a commercial facility as a hub and spoke model. And then in 2001, after uh, probably a couple of years of um, uh, engagements with um, uh, public hospitals, the Nuclear Medicine Association, and radiologists, the Australian government sought tenders to establish what was known as the 10 sites. Um, and those 10 sites were structured 
to actually look at 10 indications and gather the the data the clinical data so that the so that the federal government could assess whether it would continue funding uh, pet ct in australia and so there were 10 indications a significant data bank was established and the federal government went out collecting that information from 10 sites and the government were paying for this what's what was called the medical benefits scheme which is the federal government's way of providing the public access to um, uh, medical services like PET CT, MRI, and CTs. 2002, we, we established the facility. We were operating, I think, in July 20, 2002, and we listed a price of FDG at 375 plus freight because we were shipping freight. I'm not sure if you understand Australians' logistics, but we were going from Melbourne to Western Australia, Melbourne to Queensland, and Melbourne to Tasmania, and everywhere else in the, in the country. So those of the 10 sites, I think we were supporting eight of them. TGA then came out with um, uh, a guidance document in 2009, and this was a pivotal document for, for our industry because the, the, the Therapeutic Goods Administration's uh, code of GMP sometimes is misaligned with a product like radiopharmaceuticals. And so uh, radiopharmaceuticals don't always uh, align perfectly with how, with how general pharmaceuticals are manufactured, uh, QC tested, they sit on a shelf for a period of time while you do all your paperwork, and then you distribute into the marketplace. Unfortunately, due to the decay factor, uh, we lack time between the end of synthesis um, and actually getting it to the patient for injection uh, as, as a finished use product. So the TGA's guide to manufacturing sterile radiopharmaceutical is a, is a critical document, and it's been um, upgraded three times, the latest one in 2019. From there, in 2019, the Australian government expanded the indications of use for PET CT cameras using FDG. Um, and in that time period, about 40 sites uh, commenced operating outside of the original 10 or 12 that was set up originally. In 2010, um, Cyclotech commenced operations in New Zealand. And what's interesting is New Zealand does not have a GMP regulation like we have in Australia. So the Ministry of Health uh, applied the Office of Radiation to manage and regulate Cyclotech's operations. So it's predominantly around the safe handling and the safe operations of a radiopharmaceutical facility. That is the principal uh, regulator for Cyclotech uh, in New Zealand. But to be consistent, Cyclotech New Zealand does follow uh, a significant um, quality package that the Cyclotech Australia team use today. And then in 2016-70, we built two more facilities, one in Brisbane and one in Melbourne. Again, it was to meet customer demand. So Cyclotech tries to be maybe one or two years ahead of the curve so that by the time we bring these facilities on board, the customer demand is growing with us and so that we can be a reliable and capable manufacturer. In 2019, the Australian government um, did something that I thought was not possible. They introduced a new uh, medical benefit scheme uh, rebate for FDG breast cancer. Um, and then we decided that we needed a full Eastern Seaboard capability. So I went out and acquired two other facilities that were already uh, established in New South Wales. One is the, the federal government, ANSTO, and the other one was a public company called Cyclofarm. And then in 2022, Cyclotech lodged an application. We got uh, PSMA listed on the medical benefit scheme. Uh, 1 July 22, prostate cancer PSMA is now a diagnostic uh, for Australian men with prostate cancer. And then in 2023, I, I believe there's approximately 100 PET CTs operating with a population in Australia of 25 million people. So... What made Cyclotech? And I think this is a question that uh, a few people have asked me since I've been through Indonesia and other locations. I think it really stemmed from um, meeting the right doctors at the right time. And what I mean by that is, uh, not many might know, but um, prior to Cyclotech, I was an, an accountant by trade, uh, doing a fair bit of uh, restructuring and uh, re-engineering of companies. And I just happened to meet uh, a Professor Rod Hicks at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre at the time, together with other doctors. But he embedded in me the ethos of patient is first. 
patient-centric care is what we should be saying on a regular basis. And, and he, he honed that in on me as being one of my critical components that I should take forward. He also uh, brought up that you've got to manufacture to the customer needs, not manufacture to the manufacturer's needs. So that's, that's a critical component of Cyclotech. And we need to build at a price that's affordable for all stakeholders. That's the government, the customers, society, and even the company. Um, we spoke heavily about a hub and spoke model where you can get economies of scale. And with economies of scale, you could actually then reinvest in the industry. And that's what Cyclotech has done for 15 years, reinvested um, each year in developing new and improved methodologies. And again, build to expand, replicate and thrive has been the... Um, uh, the, the the motto of the directors and the shareholders of the company. How did, how did we operate? One of the key things, and I've said this to a few people, we actually work backwards from the patient. So we put the patient first and then we figure out all the other criterias of operating our manufacturing plant around making sure the patient gets their dose when they need it and in the volume that, that is needed for that injection. And I've listed out some four key components there uh, the last one is really critical. You've got to build relationships with your customers, with regulators, service providers, and vendors. Cyclotech, we spend a lot of time working those, those areas of our business, and I think that pays dividends in the uptime of our cyclotrons, a 99-plus percent uptime um, with two planned maintenances per year for about three days. Uh, we're pretty much running full steam all the time. Um, this slide was presented just before, so it gives you a bit of a snapshot from very humble beginnings in 2002. Um, you can see the blue line or the, the blue blue area on the left-hand side all the way now to the um, pinkish colour on the right. Uh, that's only for two years because uh, these, these groupings are in three-year intervals. So as you can see, um, FDG in the Australian context is growing quite substantially at around about 15 to 20%. So Mark, do you want to talk about this slide in reference to um, how we think um, quality structure could be brought to bear in the Indonesian context uh, to make sure that a, um, a highly uh, uh, efficient facility that's operating at a, a larger level than uh, current cyclotrons are operating, what would be a quality framework that could uh, work for Indonesia? Absolutely, Ken. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the PICS uh, guidance um, for GMP document, now that, that's the gold standard uh, across some um, pharmaceutical industry around the world. That's actually a document that's based on the um, ICH guidelines, which is the um, International Conference for Harmonisation. If you, if you look at the two documents there, they're essentially built one-to-one -one um, when we're actually uh, um, inspected by a, a regulator, um, we're inspected um, with respect to our conformance to, to PICS um, and our, our pharmaceutical quality systems alignment to that particular um, code of GMP. Um, it, it starts with, um, uh, for us, um, as Greg mentioned earlier, the, um, uh, the interpretation guideline um, that is a document that the TGA brought out in 2009. Um, that is the interpretation for the manufacturing for sterile rate of pharmaceuticals that's um, uh, labelled with fluorine 18. Um, but the, the key um, aspects of PICS itself um, beyond that particular guidance documents are all the, uh, the chapters which uh, um, provide guidance on how to establish a pharmaceutical quality system. The, the personnel that you need to introduce to manufacture, um, the premises and equipment that are, um, are utilised for manufacturing purposes, the, the guidance documentation as well as the um, record keeping for your, your products, um, your production and quality control operations, as well as any guidance towards outsourcing activities. Uh, beyond that, there's also um, uh, additional um, guidance surrounding complaints from the final product as well as what to do if there is in fact an issue with your um, with your product as well and uh, also gives you guidance with respect to um, inspecting yourself for compliance towards uh, your um, your day-to-day -day operations 
In supporting um, uh, the main aspects of PICS, there's annexes um, that are, are provided uh, that uh, give you a little bit more guidance uh, towards uh, your pharmaceutical manufacturing operations. Annex 1 is, is fairly key for our particular type of operations because we, we do, in fact, manufacture a sterile product. Um, so Annex 1, with respect to the requirements surrounding the manufacturing of sterile products, is, is important, as is the manufacture of radiopharmaceuticals. Um, uh, ancillary um, documentation or annex guidances uh, included uh, with uh, respect to your starting materials and packaging materials. Um, quite, uh, quite significant in, um, in uh, our operations is the qualification and validation of our processes. This is mainly important because we manufacture a sterile product that is utilised fairly quickly. Um, so we don't have um, all uh, data that's able to be assessed with respect to the quality of the product prior to the product being used. So we're heavily reliant on our, um, our validation and qualification practices to ensure that uh, quality is built into the product itself. Um, Real-time release is also is important because we utilise the, the time post-manufacture and in-between um, quality um, control um, testing to actually um, uh, supply our product to, um, uh, to hospital sites. Um, so we've, we utilise that, um, that time between release um, to test our product prior to um, release for use. Um, Annex 19 is also a, a, a fairly important uh, um, Annex guideline that uh, provides you guidance with respect to reference and retention samples as well. Um, from, from a regulatory point of view, um, it is advisable to focus on the, to take a very similar approach to what the TGA took in Australia and focus on, a, um, on the quality attributes that really matter to the product uh, in itself. Um, and that provides for a, a fairly efficient and viable um, regulatory framework. Um, and, and an example of that is um, if, if we look at the TGA, about 10 years ago, we weren't um, regulated against um, our computerized systems. The, the TGA has evolved since then, and it is, in fact, uh, looking at uh, more stringent um, uh, um, regulations. Um, however, the, the approach has evolved over the last few years as well. So what, what actually gives regulators confidence in Cyclotec? Um, in, in discussion with a, a, a regulator um, uh, quite some time ago, they actually asked me what what gives Cyclotec confidence in ourselves? So why, why are Cyclotec um, confident in their processes. And it all depends on what makes up a facility and manufacturing process. These could actually be um, separated into um, uh, five different categories. Um, these categories uh, are actually not just uh, um, restricted to radiopharmaceutical manufacturing. In fact, they're, they're common to uh, manufacturing activities um, for different industries as well. And these align with the methods, materials, uh, your machines, which is split into equipment, computerized systems, your information technology infrastructure, um, man and environment as well. So, um, what we look at, we, we have certain enablers that allow us to plan um, and assess a process before we bring a new product on, online. We, we do risk assessments for our products. We identify the, the key components uh, within those um, processes, the, the materials that make up a process, we assess them, we qualify them. The equipment that's in a process, we assess them, we qualify them, the personnel, that are used um, within a process, we, we qualify them, we train them, we, we have documentation that allows us to ensure that we're, we're bringing on systems that allow us to be confident that when we um, introduce a new product or a system um, online, we, we're able to manufacture and process um, that product um, according to GMP guidelines. Thanks, Greg. Um, one of our key tools to bring a product online is to utilise what's known as a validation planning spreadsheet for new products. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, all the processes are taken through significant rigours to, um, uh, to establish a validated state, um, to ensure that there's appropriate guidance that's uh, provided to our staff. That's either through training or through documentation. 
and establish programs that allow for continued continued assessment and maintenance of our our product. Now, this framework that we have established, as as mentioned earlier, it's it's against PICS and it's um, integrated within our pharmaceutical quality system, and and dictated by our um, technology transfer validation master plan. So when we do bring a new product online, um, that new product uh, um, package. Um, includes a validation plan package, a documentation package, uh, material and equipment qualification, as well as environmental classification for the manufacturing environment. We do assess and uh, um, validate the analytical methods, um, the processes themselves, and the processes are further broken down into synthesis, the sterilization process, and any aseptic practices that are um, uh, taken uh, as part of that um, that. Uh, process requirement. We assess the product's um, stability, we validate that. We also assess the container closure and operator qualifications. When we, um, after we've uh, um, brought our product online, validated our product, it goes into what is known as our routine GMP manufacturing. Um, this uh, is uh, integrated within Psychotech's um, portfolio, which, which is, follows a, a the same pharmaceutical quality system, but we have additional programs that allow us to ensure routine compliant manufacturing. And this includes preventative maintenance program, requalification on a, on a routine and regular basis. Um, when things uh, do go wrong, we assess uh, the deviations. Um, we have document uh, management system and training management allows us to ensure continued um, guidance provided to our staff. Whenever anything is uh, requiring a change, we have a change management system that allows for it. Um, and, and all this is uh, um, takes into consideration um, risk, which is at the forefront of any, any particular change. Um, process monitoring is also quite important. Uh, so we, we do have regular self-inspection and we assess uh, audit trails within our, um, our systems as well. Um, recall and farm vigilance allows us to assess uh, if there if there is uh, any problem with products in the market where we know about it and we could uh, adjust things accordingly. Um, we we have evolved our PQS. This isn't something that uh, was established overnight. We did take some some time and uh, some configuring to ensure that we're established. Uh, um, our PQS according to PICS. Um, we, we have learned a lot from our regulators over the last few years. We have evolved with the regulators. We have, um, the regulator has evolved with us. We, we did take a, um, a fair uh, amount of input and place that into um, that guidance document for the interpretation for manufacturing uh, fluorinated products. We also learned a lot from our um, technology transfer um, transfers that we performed with uh, our US and European based pharmaceutical companies. Um, Greg mentioned the, the evolution of Psychotech earlier. So um, bringing those new facilities online, um, each time we brought a new facility online, we did learn um, from, from bringing, on, in bringing on those new facilities, um, things that we, we can bring onto a, a, a new facility um, and uh, what we can integrate to our PQS as well. Um, on top of that, um, Psychotech uh, have also been involved with uh, bringing our knowledge that we've learned in the past to other radio pharmaceutical manufacturing organisations. So um, other radio pharmaceutical organisations have actually come to us to, um, to better understand what we do for certain processes. Well, an example of that, um, uh, as of uh, I think late last year, a, an, an external organisation came to us to ask us how we validated our, our procedure for filter sterilisation. We're actually, in fact, uh, um, incorporating that and doing that as a service to other organisations as well. So we have been able to um, provide advice to the industry within Australia as well. Thanks, Greg. So I think, the as I said before, one of the key components of um, Cyclotech is making sure you've got a robust training program. Staff do come and go. Uh, the key to it is to make sure you can retain staff engagement, but also the knowledge. A lot of the uh, procedures and processes, whilst they might be written down in SOPs and um, uh, documents, 
one of the key things is your eyesight and vision, and that's critical in our, our industry. We spend a lot of time with our staff. Um, yes, there's fo follow procedures, please, but keep your eyes open and because um, little things do go wrong, which, you know, every facility has uh, some interesting quirks that happen, but your eyesight and vision as an employee is critical. So that's why a well-trained uh, a well-trained workforce is critical. Um, we provide a significant amount of support and promotion through that program. So training programs across radio chemists, quality control chemists, quality assurance. They're the people who are looking at the documents and the data to make sure that they oblige and align with our quality systems and microbiologists to make sure that our environment and products are operating at the levels uh, expected for manufacture. When we bring all these things together, we have five key components that I always strive for, and that's product and making sure it's safe. that's our safety comp component. Quality makes us capable. Having good operations means that we can be reproducible day in, day out. Having a good corporate ethos, and we call that three E's, equip, encourage, and empower our workforce, that means we'll be sustainable. And with good investments, you build out patient benefits and these are the five things that as a shareholder in Cyclotech, I'm a director of Cyclotech, I'm the CEO, but with my fellow uh, directors and corporate um, um, bodies, the rest of my senior management team all follow these five key principles when they operate the business at the, um, the root of the uh, manufacturing side of things. I just wanted to go into logistics because the other side of our business, because radio being radio, radioactivity and pharmaceuticals being the products, um, I just wanted to give a bit of a, a snapshot of how we do it here in Australia. Um, and as you can see on the far left side, we have a, a tungsten pig, um, which keeps the product or the activity that's in a, a 10 or a 15 mil vial in the centre of that tungsten pig secure. And you'll see the lid is screwed down. That pig goes into what's called a Taipei packaging. And so the pig plus the boxes next to it, when it's all sealed up with Cyclotech tape, is actually deemed a, a type A package. And that's been validated by independent parties who follow the IAA program of validating um, packages of a uh, radioactive class three that we have here at Cyclotech. And basically, we then use local transport vans, um, as you can see there, which are uh, which have placards on them to show that when they're in, um, when they're out and about, that they are from Cyclotech and that they are carrying radioactives. And we've been doing this since 2001. Uh, on top of using um, uh, both uh, road and air transportation. And this slide just gives sorry, you a little bit. Sorry. Of... Oh, can you speed up? Speed up uh, your. Sorry. Can you speed up? Man? Speak up. Because sorry. The time but... is limited. The time is. <laughs> Yes. Okay, okay, speed up. Yes. Sorry, okay. Sorry. So, transportation. Um, and again, these are the documentation for transportation. Um, where I was going with our journey, um, on the left-hand side, to build sovereign capability, um, this is how I think we should approach our expansion. Um, and over on the right-hand side, I think this gives us the ability to get economy of scale across the uh, industry to make it all viable for all the participants. These are the things that I, I deem to be critical around investments. Um, as an example, Cyclotech's hub and spoke model is in the east coast of Australia in New Zealand. Um, this is a bit of an example of the amount of doses, uh, the imaging sites we actually support, uh, the amount of road uh, movements, 25,000 boxes are moved. Um, and the amount of um, radiation we produce in our cyclotrons across the entire fleet is about 20,000 curies. And again, we're supported by uh, a significant bunch of um, radio pharmaceutical companies overseas and uh, research engagements. And um, we're interested in working with um, our regional partners here to build a sustainable and vibrant industry for radio pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Okay. So now we, we uh, continue to the second uh, paper, please. Uh, who will be the speaker? Uh, Professor Laksana, it will be myself, John Evans. Okay.
Hajar Evans please. Yeah, the time is yours. Uh, maybe can be uh, about 10 minutes for following discussion because we have to uh, stop at 12. Of I'm yeah. with you. Yeah, I'll be fast. Uh, is that on the screen? There we go. Uh, so my uh, section of the talk, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and I'm John Evans. I've got responsibility for um, taking Psychotech across into the ASEAN region. And that's part of the vision <laughs> of Psychotech is to create sovereign capability in its um, regional partners. Uh, we've heard a lot about Psychotech. Um, probably one of the features is that the engagement with Psychotech offers uh, Indonesia a, a, a way to actually learn the lessons of 20 years. Um, and some of that is in the pain and agony. It's not all success. So one of the opportunities that Indonesia has as a result of Psychotech coming to Indonesia is to leapfrog uh, a number of those learnings. Uh, the the other part that I wanted to talk about and the opportunity uh, for Indonesia and having Psychotech Indonesia established is that it's the whole industry has now gone what I call past the tipping point. So what's evident now is a, an industry which is still dominated by FDG, but is on the cusp of an enormous number of uh, alternative and new radio pharmaceuticals. What we're Psychotech is um, able to bring to Indonesia is it's really created a platform from which expansion can occur rapidly and safely. So one of the things that um, we know as a business is there's more than 60 companies with approximately 100 trials or preclinical trials underway of new radio pharmaceuticals. One of the, one of the unfortunate aspects for the future of, of places which don't have their own sovereign capability of radio pharmaceutical, new radio pharmaceutical manufacturing is they'll miss out on the clinical trials, therefore the people will miss out. So sorry, sorry, can you can you yeah make it bigger the few? Yeah. yeah. Uh, where? I think in the Yes. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. Sorry. Okay. That better? Yes. Yes, better. Yeah. Uh, so this really is just a capture of the um, products that are coming online, uh, and you can see the accelerated pace upon which they which they come. One of the other things, just to capture the expansion of the global market, uh, and particularly in the context of what we've been talking about today. Uh, is you can see how fast the market is growing uh, in terms of new product, but then also market size. So the speed and the utilisation of radio pharmaceuticals is accelerating, but particularly, as you'll note, it's not just in the diagnostics, but it's actually predominantly in the therapeutics. So one of the things that we need to focus on for Indonesia is creating that sovereign capability to be able to um, you know, manufacture those new products as they come online. Uh, of course, as the person responsible for ASEAN, it's evident to me to just get a sense of where everybody was up to in their development. Uh, and while Singapore probably is um, most developed, it's quite evident. Now, so I'll, I'll share an insight into Malaysia, for an example. Malaysia's got three cyclotrons and 17 PET CTs. It is asking for assistance to accelerate. And that means that um, we're talking in partnership in, in Malaysia to actually speed its um, production of radio pharmaceuticals because even for a population size of 34 million, they know as having um, 17 PET CTs is not enough. And it's indicative of um, not being able to provide access to the care that its population wants. So, one of the and the great limiting factor identified for a number of um, countries across ASEAN is access to quality radio traces and radio pharmaceuticals is actually what's actually slowing down uh, the development um, because you can't make an investment decision 
uh, in terms of putting in a PET CT unless you've got access to the, the radio, radio pharmaceuticals in terms of quality and guaranteed supply at a price uh, that able, you're able to take it to market. Uh, I won't dwell on that because we've been through and also uh, pretty well covered already uh, is the fact that there's a great opportunity for Indonesia to speed its um, development of the industry here. Uh, and that's part of what's exciting uh, for Cyclotech Indonesia is um, working with partners to actually accelerate the industry. Uh, one of the solutions in terms of um, the approach that Cyclotech Indonesia would bring is the capability to do the centralised radio, pharm radio pharmacy. If we go back and um, we remember what we've already heard today, one of the really critical issues is the ability to do this at volume. Uh, and obviously, Psychotech Indonesia would look forward to working with government, the regulators and the industry uh, in achieving what we call a hub and spoke model, therefore a centralised radio pharmaceutical production place, which is doing enough volume uh, to enable guaranteed supply at a price, which means that care is accessible. And that really means addressing some of the um, already identified um, hurdles that will need to be overcome in the Indonesian context in terms of actual distribution of the product. Uh, I might ask Greg to talk very quickly about what we've learnt about the product supply decay over time. Uh, and one of the critical elements uh, is about the placement of where the cyclotron is, how it operates, and to take Greg's earlier point, you've really got to know your customer base, what patients they have, when they operate, how many patients, and how far is the point of distribution. Greg, do you want to add anything to this slide? No, John, I think um, you've hit it. The, the items in red are predominantly what one of our facility does at the moment. So that's uh, five sites in the three to four hours and 18 sites within the one to two hours. And you're right, it, it, it all the number of sites you can supply is all about where they're located from, a distance from the manufacturing facility. But Cyclotech has supplied radioisotopes from Melbourne to Perth, which is eight hours. So um, the um, hub and spoke model does work. One of the critical factors of the success of, it might look like it's quite a, uh, a significant shift in terms of um, where Indonesia might be currently, but the, this wasn't done overnight. So the trust in, cy in Cyclotech in its ability to distribute safely and effectively um, in, its, in working with partnership with the regulators has been a critical ingredient. Uh, we look forward to doing the same with the regulators here. Um, I might um, not necessarily go over um, the same issue of economics and economy of scale and need, but actually talk about the model which um, Cyclotech is going to bring through its Cyclotech Indonesia venture. So Cyclotech Indonesia will be an investor itself and an operating partner. So therefore, looking at utilising its experience in production and operations, business setup, GMP, expertise transfer, business planning, site and facility design are critical elements which um, will give the industry in Indonesia an opportunity to, as I say, leapfrog the 20 years of development. What we're, uh, the approach Cyclotech Indonesia is going to use is to create an Indonesian centre of excellence in radio pharmaceuticals, but that's not on its own. Cyclotech's approach to business is to partner uh, and a case example is in New Zealand, uh, in Malaysia and in Singapore, where we have partners in the local space who we are transferring the knowledge and capability uh, so we can actually focus on the higher order, what's next in radio pharmaceuticals. Um, but right now, the emphasis in Indonesia needs to be ensuring that we actually address the issue of FDG supply um, because it's not... Uh, at a price point, uh, as pointed out earlier, which makes it more difficult to be accessible to other people. The other part is this model of um, hub and spoke um, is critical to the um, operational sustainability. Uh, I'm not sure I'll, for the sake of leaving ourselves enough time to actually have a discussion, but effectively um, 
the earlier slide indicates that one cyclotron can actually provide a significant number of PET CT machines as long as we address the issues of logistics and transfer uh, and transport. Uh, and Greg touched briefly on all the work that's been done over the last 10 years about ensuring um, safe and effective transportation. Uh, just in terms of the stages of development as like a tech uh, engineer would see, and this has been done uh, in conjunction with a number of parties, um, we see that potentially in the next, uh, the next first stage of development in Indonesia would need to be uh, another four cyclotrons at these locations based on where the customers um, are. And that's really, as to Greg's earlier point, what drives the cyclotech approach to business is you've got to meet what the customers need so the customers can make their own investments and pursue those investments and operational startup. Um, you've got to give confidence to the customers about you, they're going to get adequate supply. Uh, so it really is just another reflection of that, the sense of who's, who's the potential customers in the future, where should the cyclotron be, uh, and how are we going to work in partnership with the regulator to address issues of safety and quality and transportation. Um, this is the final slide of which I will just pause for and go through in a little bit more detail where we're up to in the development in Indonesia. One is um, we're in the process of establishing Psychotech Indonesia and appointing directors, so that's in progress. Uh, we have identified, in fact, I'm in Jakarta, I'm coming to you from Jakarta, because we are meeting with partners uh, and establishing those partnerships um, to enable that sovereign capability development. Uh, and the next first, the, in the next 12 months, we need to set up the first uh, cyclotron and radio pharmaceutical unit where we can actually not just, I think one of the one of the issues that is hard to communicate about uh, getting optimal productivity out of your cyclotron and optimal safety and optimal delivery of care is that the, there's an enormous amount of work, um, as Greg would say, uh, the easiest bit is buying the cyclotron. Uh, it's actually, uh, that's where the work begins and it needs to be done, that work needs to be done in partnership with the regulators. So we would envisage uh, to set up a unit within the first 12 months uh, and in the subsequent 12 to 24 months, set up the second and third units. Um, we have a capability to bring products like the Tisham to market immediately. Uh, through um, a supply agreement we have with partners, but also we need to start thinking about creating that centre of excellence so we can manufacture the new radio pharmaceuticals as they arise so that Indonesia can participate in international clinical trials and therefore bringing not just diagnostic products but therapeutic products to the population. So in that phase three in the next, in the next years, two to three, it really is creating and setting up the fourth, as well as the radio pharmaceutical um, center of excellence. Thank you. I think that hopefully Professor Luxone leaves up some opportunity <coughs> to have discussion. Yes, thank you, Mr. John Evans. Okay, it's very interesting uh, presentation for the two presenters. Now is the time for discussion. Is there any? Uh, question, please, uh, or maybe comments, uh, or maybe comments from MOH, also Pat Hans. Uh, is there any comments? From the chat? Yeah, you can, you can write uh, in the chat, yeah. Okay, if not, uh, I'm asking Pahans, yeah. Okay, there is a uh, echo. Okay. Chat from Paiko. Is it a mandatory for a research facility and or hospital in Australia producing radio pharmaceutical products to have GMP certification? Okay, please. Professor Alexander, okay. uh, the answer to that simply is no. They, um, a public hospital 
uh, has certain exemptions for their research activities. Uh, but under ICH guidelines for clinical trials, if a phase two, uh, three and above clinical trial is happening, uh, under those guidelines, the products would have to be manufactured under GMP. So our public hospitals here in Australia, uh, majority of them have a GMP license to mania FDG, and then they manufacture most of their other products outside of a GMP framework. Okay. Is that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mr. Eko, Pak Eko? Puas dengan jawaban ini atau mau membuka mikrofon silakan. Pak Iko. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> other comments or questions? If not, uh, I will ask Pak Hans uh, uh, about uh, what is the prospect. Uh, and you can you can discuss also with uh, Pa Evans or Pa Santa Maria about if yeah the scenario if uh, the the products from the Australian Cyclotech comes to Indonesia whether it will be uh, cheaper uh, or not in terms of the cost of uh, production. Pa Hans, yes, please. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Prof. Lasono. Probably after this, John or Greg could continue with the with the discussion. But uh, I think uh, the point is that uh, at the moment now they are selling the FDG in Australia is uh, around two fifty to three seventy five uh, Australian dollar per dose. Compared to Indonesia, it's almost the double uh, the Indonesian cost of productions. They indicate. This indicative that it is going to be a very practical that if they applied the lean model here in Indonesia with the central facilities uh, model, I think it can be reduce the price of the uh, PET scan in Indonesia as well. Second thing also, the labor cost in Indonesia compared to Australia, of course, it's going to be much, much uh, lower. So it can be, I'm quite competitive that it's going to be a, a, a good for Indonesian uh, benefit, uh, Prof. And as well as the, you absolutely right, the, the curve of the innovation here, yeah, that now probably still on the innovation, but uh, later on when we have the scale, yeah, it can scale up and uh, the, it make the, the, uh, the cheaper price as well. Yeah, that's the opening, I think. Yes, yeah. you're right. Okay. Yep. I think um, economies of scale is where Cyclotech is now. Pre we started off uh, 20 years ago at 375, but because of the number of doses, as I put up on my slide, 150 156,000 doses across um, six facilities, um, if you get that scale, um, you can reduce the price. And Cyclotech has um, reduced the price Voluntarily, we haven't actually been forced to reduce our price, but it gave our customers um, a better return on their investment to expand and develop further. Okay. Okay. So there's a question. What are the most potential isotopes in the future? And for layout, do we need to prepare for LU-177 generator in the future? or any other possible isotopes starting from the beginning? Um, Professor Luxon, that's a, a question I get asked many times at conferences. Um, the answer is uh, yes to all the above. Um, I think it's important, lutetium, lutetium PSMA uh, and dotatate have actually taken off significantly globally, but there are other radioisotopes using the same um, targeting mechanism, PSMA and dotatate, that could actually be uh, more beneficial. So um, the beauty for Indonesia is that it's got this vast uh, global knowledge that's already out there, but you can now be picking at the at the top of the tree all the new radioisotopes like terbium, uh, lead 212, that are actually potentially far better than lutetium 177. But that's to be proven, and I think that's the benefit of having facilities that are designed in a way that gives Indonesia uh, not to be locked into just single fluorine FDG production, 
but as John said, to build the, the third and the fourth facilities to be a little bit bigger, to cater for the new radioisotopes that are coming through over the next few years. Uh, for diagnostics, copper-64 uh, is, is widely seen as a, an isotope of choice for diagnostics. Uh, and there's a, an array of therapeutics that I think if we, if we design and forward think, um, I think Indonesia would be well set up for the next 10 to 20 years of maintaining their radiopharmaceutical industry and growing it. Okay, so it is optimistic view. Absolutely. Yes. So you think that um, there is still a big room for expansion for cyclotron in Indonesia, yeah? Well, many years ago, I built a facility that I was told I was a bit ignorant, which is about uh, 10 metres by 10 metres. And back then we had, um, we only took up probably about three metres by three metres of that space. Uh, today, I'm annoyed that I didn't make it bigger um, because we're landlocked now. We can't, we can only produce what we're now producing, which is forcing me to set up two new facilities here in Melbourne. Um and they're going to be interim measures uh, while I figure out what is my final design for Melbourne, which will be quite a large, probably about 2,000 square metres of, um, of uh, warehouse. Okay, thank you. So another question from Angrida. Uh, okay, so, so before, uh, Pak Wirawan, is it okay, Pak? Sudah? Oh, Pak good, Wirawan? Bob. Thank you, Pak. Okay, okay. Okay, from Ibu Angrida, maybe I missed some information from slide presentations. Can you please explain how many the products from Cyclotech have marketing authorization from TGA, both for diagnostic and therapeutic? Yep, so Cyclotech has approximately 12 fluorinated uh, products uh, that we um, sell into the Australian marketplace. Um, and we have two therapeutics that are regularly supplied uh, in Australia. Cyclotech is a licensed manufacturer from the TGA. And in the slide, there was a, uh, a license. And the license says that we can make any fluorinated product or any lutetium based product. So we can expand our portfolio um, within fluorine and lutetium in Melbourne, I can expand copper 64 in Queensland, and I'm looking at expanding zirconium capability in one of our other facilities. So once we have the radioisotope approval, we can then add products to that. So at the moment, all up, 12 products in diagnostics and two in therapeutics. Six of the diagnostics are in um, uh, um, uh, neurological diseases, for instance, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Was that... Okay, Professor Laksana. Okay, Ibu Angrida, it's okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, can you hear me well? Sorry. Yes, yes, please. Yes. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for the uh, information. So based on the uh, information given by, uh, uh, God, uh, uh, Greg, uh, so the, uh, the different thing, uh, GMB scheme for the Australia, so they have, actually a certified uh, radio isotope uh, uh, based on the radio isotope that is produced. Is that correct? So then you then, so then uh, after that, you don't need to have a, a, a submission for marketing authorization for TGA based on the radio isotope uh, certifi certification. I just want to uh, clarify and get confirmation for that. Thank you. Greg, I could take this if, if you wish. Yep. Um, uh, with respect to, uh, to the um, Therapeutic Goods Act, there are certain exemptions for um, uh, listing on the ARTG. Um, so the Australian Register for Therapeutic Goods is the, um, is the register that actually en en enables us to have marketing authorisation. Um, the, the, the Therapeutic Goods Act actually exempts um, uh, certain uh, uh, manufacturers from listing on the ARTG, well, their products anyway. And our, our exemptions are, are based on, um, uh, um, for us specifically on compound manufacturing, extemporaneous compound manufacturing, whereby we supply the product one-to-one -to, -one to a patient. So our products are in fact exempt from uh, um, uh, marketing authorization. Thank you, it's quite clear right now.
Oke. Okay. Any other questions? If not, Pak Budi pasti ada ya, Pak Budi. Halo, Pak Budi. Pak Budi sudah ada, masih ada? Halo. Pak Budi ini? Pak Budi masih ada, Ma ya? Mohon maaf, Pak. Sudah live. Oh, sudah live, ya. Ya, oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Prof. So, Sono. Uh, ya. Ya, Dokter Fatema, Prof. Ya. So. Oh, Bu Fatema. Silakan Bu Fatema. Ya. Ya, yeah, so. Uh, silakan, silakan. The question is, uh, is there any uh, opportunity for Indonesia learning from the uh, psychotech or the other center in Australia? For the, we want to learn about the process. Uh, the best practice, uh, how to provide the, and how to produce a day and how to distribute um, a good distribution uh, standard uh, in Australia so we can learn more about that. Is there, is there any chance to uh, Indonesian company for develop the uh, cyclotron, I mean, um, radio pharmaca to learn from the Australia? Uh, thank you. That's my question. Okay. Do you want me to leave that to you? Uh, my name is Dr. Fatema, and I'm a cardiac surgeon. But right now, I'm I'm looking for the radio pharmaca development in Indonesia. Oh, please, can you answer? Oh, sorry, Greg, I was on mute when I was through to you. Um, the, the the short answer is absolutely uh, the whole. Uh, ethos of psychotech's uh, approach to to care, which is its approach to business, is about partnership. Uh, it is about working together to um, increase the sovereign capability. So, absolutely, uh, Greg, you want to say anything else about the prospect of partnership? Well, I think that's the the the, the rationale where. We've moved into this region or want to move into this region. And as John said, we're looking for partnerships. And, and uh, through those partnerships, absolutely, um, building upon the platforms of Cyclotech, we can bring those platforms into country. So the another question to you, is there any uh, uh, also learn about the GMP? You know the... We have still have a challenge for the GMP certification in Indonesia. So probably we need to also share about the how the regulation for the GMP for the radio pharmaca for Indonesian uh, regulation. Thank you. So that's a good question. Um, and I think in one of the slides I put up in the presentation, there was um, uh, a design of a framework that we could work with the regulator on aspects to make it um, more harmonious for harmonious for GMP manufacturing. I think we can answer that question um, when we're sitting down with all the stakeholders working out what's best for Indonesia and how far to look at the pharmaceutical uh, convention as to uh, manufacturing products in country. But I think the slide that I presented, we went through all the, all the pharmaceutical uh, annexes and chapters and looked at what would be very specific for setting up a new industry and having a good framework to build a quality product for patients that are affordable. Okay, maybe Bu Fatima, if, if you are interested, I think, I think we can have like a arrangement to visit Australia to see the detail of the uh, psychotron ecosystem there. Is it possible there to visit yeah. you in Australia? Absolutely. One of There's nothing like seeing it live uh, to um, and having that relationship building uh, exercise. So we welcome people. Well, obviously, I'm in Jakarta now. We're obviously be in Indonesia, but equally important that people have a, an ability to come visit and see for themselves um, is a great idea. And people yeah. are welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can arrange the meeting also with the regulatory board this in Australia if we visit there. 
Yeah, ab- absolutely. The, ch- the, the, the regulators uh, will be uh, appropriately reserved in um, the commentary, but it is important to firsthand uh, experience them. So we welcome also the Indonesian regulators to um, visit and come see firsthand how the, um, the manufacturing process itself occurs, but also most importantly because of the issues of distribution how that's managed and how the risks are managed. And I think fundamentally Indonesia has signed up to the, the PICS um, strategy. So all the, all the aspects of operations are actually, actually written uh, within that document that is globally available as the framework. And I think looking at how we, how we approach uh, the quality aspects, yep, that's about learning what's best uh, for making sure the product is a quality product. I note in the questions there, uh, Professor Loxano, if I can, uh, there was a question around sterility uh, testing before release. And that's a really good question. Uh, Cyclotech has multiple um, critical process parameters that we actually monitor and actually validate to ensure that when we uh, dispense through a sterile filter, uh, that the highest probability of a pure product is manufactured at the time of dispensing. And we then validate that um, that product over its shelf life of about 12 hours. So we, we actually have a validation process that demonstrates that the product is sterile at the point of, of manufacture, knowing that it takes 14 days or 16 okay. days for the p- paperwork to occur. Uh, Prof. Laksono, in their regulation, uh, I see the the car is only for the distribution of the FTG. Uh, I would like to know, is there any uh, other uh, vehicle to use uh, uh, to distribute the, the FDG in your country? Is only a car or can be by, by bicycle or airplane? Um, it's car and airplane. We use car and airplane at the moment to deliver our products. We don't use bikes or motorbikes. So when you use the um, car, is the car is uh, also covered by the uh, uh, PB? Uh, PB is a... Uh, Wira, uh, apa PB, Wira? Timbao, I mean... Lid. Lid. A lid. 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 It's uh, covered by lid. I, the car... Uh, are the cars leased? Yes. Uh, no, the, we own the, them. We no. we we buy. Right. No? Sorry. No, correct. I mean, it's it's a a lead. 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 Uh, timbang, lead. 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 Yeah. For protective. Yeah. For protective. Yes. Yes. The one for the X-ray, the plumbum. I'm not getting that hard. I think I think Greg, the question is whether the uh, the cars are lead shielded. Oh no! Yeah, yes, not. that's my question. Ah, shielded. Um, the the box that I showed you a picture of, the pig in the box, that's the shielding right at the source, and the cars are normal cars, and the boxes are secured in the vans. They so don't just the- sit. They don't sit there. They're actually secured to the floor. Okay, so the enough the box uh, only. Uh, the the secure box for the for the FDG's uh, uh, the tung- files, yes, protection. Yeah, the tungsten pig uh, uh, makes it a, a transport index of one to one and a half. If that helps you. When you re- release the FDG, so do you waiting for the QC done yes. or? Oh, no, we no? we release we release to go on the car so that we save time. Um, so once we've disp- once we've dispensed the product, it gets packaged up and goes in a car, and then we spend the next I think it's forty five minutes doing forty five minutes to an hour doing all the QC tests, um, and we give then the customer what's called a QC release notification form, uh, well before the first injection time. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, one more question. Okay. Uh, sorry. Because the time is limited, so 
I have a question for the Cyclotech team about product registration from Anto. As we know that FTG have a short half-life. It's FTG registration mandatory according to Australian regulations? No, oh. it's not required. It's not required to be on the um, Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. Um, as Mark said, it was uh, our, our industry is exempt from being registered so long as we are a licensed manufacturer of, um, of GMP grade product. So the TGA inspect us on a two yearly, three yearly basis uh, to ensure that we're complying to the code. Um, and if we are complying to the code, our products are available to be sold uh, into the Australian marketplace according to our license. And our license says if um, fluorinated products and lutetium based products, the radioisotope has been the lead reason for supply. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now uh, the time uh, is up. Okay, I think we have to uh, finish this uh, discussion. It's very interesting. Uh, so many uh, questions um, and also inquiry to learn about the Australian ecosystem for cyclotron and also the prospect of Cyclotech in uh, Indonesia. Okay, I think we have to this uh, here at, at, at this point, but I think this is not uh, the first meeting, okay. Uh, it will be continuous, many, maybe our other meetings, yeah. uh, but maybe if we have time, I think it's pretty good for uh, Indonesians um, stakeholders to visit Australia and to learn about uh, the ecosystem in detail uh, in a good uh, or in a comprehensive manner. Yeah. So, okay, I will, I will talk to you later on on this issue. Okay, saya kira terima kasih sekali ya atas uh, diskusi kita yang banyak sekali ini. Ya, jadi uh, kita akan masuk ya pada pada satu uh, apa ya awal dari proses pengembangan sekali lagi pengembangan psychotron di Indonesia yang tentunya tidak bisa lepas dari apa yang kita sebut sebagai regulatory dan financingnya ya, dan pendanaannya supaya ada scaling tadi supaya ada apa economies of skillnya. Nah pertemuan hari ini akan diikuti uh, dengan uh, follow up follow up yang salah satunya mungkin kita bisa uh, visit ke Australia yang tertarik untuk ke sana nanti kita bisa bisa arrange uh, uh, satu apa ya semacam studi tour ke sana ya. Oke, okay, terima kasih sekali pada para pembicara. Thank you very much pada Pak Greg, pada Pak John Evans, Pak Hans, dan juga Pak Budi. So, see you again uh, in the next uh, occasion. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Baik, terima kasih banyak kepada Profesor Dr. Laksono Trisnantoro, MSc PhD, atas uh, perkenanannya sebagai moderator kegiatan pada siang hari ini, juga kepada para peserta sekalian yang telah mengikuti kegiatan dari pagi hingga siang, ter uh, terutama pula kepada para narasumber yang terhormat yang telah berkenan untuk mengisi sesi uh, kita pada siang hari ini. Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, terkait dengan Pasca kegiatan, Bapak dan Ibu dapat mengakses seluruh materi, kemudian rekaman, dan juga reportase kegiatan mulai esok di laman kami di https manajemenrumahsakit.net. Bapak Ibu dapat langsung menuju ke laman tersebut, kemudian mengeklik judul acara pada pagi hingga siang hari ini, yakni Webinar on Implementation of a Safe and Sustainable Radiopharmaceutical Supply and Distribution Service for Indonesia. Kami uh, dari PKMK UGM, saya Alif Indra Larasati, dan juga segenap kru yang bertugas mohon maaf apabila ada kekurangan ataupun kesalahan selama memandu kegiatan pada pagi hingga siang hari ini. Sampai bertemu di kesempatan dan juga acara-acara selanjutnya. Kami tutup. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sehat dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semuanya. Terima kasih.